Coming up on Market to Market, the EPA loses in court over small refinery exemptions. Water and land ownership collide in a Grand Canyon state debate. Poultry producers pivot after the latest outbreak of HPAI. And commodity market analysis with Arlen Suderman, next. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, December 1st edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The pressure on inflation keeps easy as the Federal Reserve weighs future action on the key interest rate. The government's preferred measure of the economy, the PCE, remained unchanged. A year ago at this time, that figure was at 3%. Excluding volatile food and energy costs, the core price slowed to two-tenths percent growth. New home sales fell 5.6% in October as the higher borrowing rate took a bite out of demand. Existing home sales reported last week were at their lowest level in 13 years. For the 28th time, the United Nations convened the Climate Change Conference this week. Global leaders look for progress on addressing emissions, financial costs, and vulnerabilities around the world. Ethanol is seen as one way to reduce greenhouse gases and is renewable. The renewable fuel standard has helped with increased use of the biorenewable by requiring refiners to blend the fuel, but smaller refineries have asked for relief from that obligation, claiming a financial burden. Another court battle played out a week ago in this arena, as Peter Tubbs reports. In a recent decision, a federal circuit court ruled the EPA had invoked an impermissibly retroactive standard to hold a group of refineries to the terms of the RFS. The case centered on the EPA's denial of six small refiner exemptions in June of 2022. The refineries argued to the court that they applied for the waivers based on previous EPA practices. The Biden administration denied those waivers in an attempt to put more ethanol in the gas tanks of American drivers. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit was not swayed by the EPA's argument that the Biden administration had made its intentions clear to take a more skeptical view of small refinery exemptions. The Fifth Circuit handles cases from district courts in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Over the past three years, the EPA has been denying small refiner exemptions at a higher rate than during the four years of the Trump administration. To receive an exemption, a petroleum refiner must prove the mandated levels of ethanol blendings are causing them undue economic harm. Production of gasoline in the United States is down 5.5 percent from its 2018 peak of 187 billion gallons. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Foreign land ownership is on the rise. According to an investigative Midwest report, land owned or leased by foreign individuals or companies has tripled since 2015. USDA records reveal 40 million acres have ties to owners outside of the United States as of 2021. And according to federal government statistics, there are 893 million acres designated as farmland. Ownership is now coalescing with the long contentious issues in the West of water rights. Colleen Bradford Krantz reports. Large swaths of the water intensive crop alfalfa sit between the mountains in the McMullen Valley just west of Phoenix, Arizona. Over the past few years, the levels in the valley's ancient aquifers have been dropping, leaving some wells bone dry. A few neighbors have been complaining since the Emirati agribusiness El Dahara began farming about 3,000 acres several years ago. 
In uh, 1957, the water level below the surface where we're standing was 107 feet. So in other words, you drilled 107 feet to touch water. Uh, today, it's 542 feet. Part of the state's issue is not knowing the exact amount of water being pulled by the mega users from the aquifers. In rural Arizona, basically, it, you know, it's the Wild West and it's subject to the law of the biggest well. So whoever has the biggest well and pumps the most groundwater wins. Uh, so it is, it is not regulated in any meaningful way. Arizona's governor yanked the state's land lease in October for another La Paz County alfalfa farm, one operated by Saudi dairy giant Al Mirai Company. Foreign and out-of-state owners of U.S. farms are not banned from farming in Arizona, nor are they prohibited from selling their goods worldwide. U.S. farmers commonly export hay and other forage crops to countries including Saudi Arabia and China. Colorado River diversion has long been a source of water for the state, and curtailed allotments have also contributed to the issue of less water. In Arizona's Cochise County, where landowners rely on groundwater, residents worry that the mega dairy operated there by Riverview LLP of Minnesota could also deplete their water supplies. The company did not respond to a request for comment about its water use. Uh, regulation can be a slippery slope if not done properly. I think looking at an area and seeing what water is there and then adjusting accordingly with the proper experts and the proper knowledge, not just shooting from the hip on a political reason, it may be an, uh, the proper way of doing it. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. A flock of 1.6 million birds in Sioux County, Iowa, have been infected with avian influenza. This brings Iowa's total casualties for this year above 2022 levels. Recovering from losses is more than a financial one. For one Iowa producer, the loss has many aspects. David Miller reports in our cover story. Nathan Hill has been an Iowa turkey producer since he was a young man. This is a family business. My grandfather started in 1947. I'm a third generation. I have two kids back from college that are in this. And so, yeah, we're definitely in it for the long haul. Every year, Hill and his family, who produce turkeys under the name Circle Hill Farms, send nearly 800,000 birds to U.S. processing plants. But nearly eight years ago, Circle Hill Farms was a victim of the 2015-2016 outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI more commonly known as bird flu. Hill's farm was among the more than 210 commercial operations across the country devastated by the virus. Producers lost more than 50 million birds nationwide. The virus rampaged through turkey operations and chicken egg laying houses in Iowa, the country's number one producer of chicken eggs. The annual production of 15 billion eggs was severely curtailed, sending the price through the roof. In the end, more than 77 cases were found among Iowa operations, impacting nearly 33 million birds. Cleanup and compensation for growers across the country cost the USDA over $910 million. Barns were cleaned, new stock brought in, and the focus went to stopping the spread of the virus. Biosecurity protocols were strengthened. Neighbors increased their vigilance, watching out for each other to prevent a new outbreak. Because of the 2015 experience, Hill implemented several biosecurity protocols and made sure his barns were tight against rodents or birds. HPAI remained under control for nearly six years until February of last year. Despite his hard work, Hill couldn't escape the surge. I've been unfortunate to have it both in 2015, I had it on a facility, and then in 2022. And in 2022, I had a neighbor that got it, and I had a, a facility that was in close proximity, and a few days later, I broke. He moved quickly to put the infected birds down and start cleanup. Even going at the fastest pace allowed by federal rules, it was still nearly a month before he could restart activities in the barn. 
For some producers, the quarantine and cleanup periods can last up to three months. The biggest thing is, number one, the quicker you can get them put down, uh, the safer it is for everybody. Hill says the effect of the virus reaches beyond the barn. Obviously, financially, it hurts you. But I think more than that, it's probably the emotional strain that it puts on everybody. Um, not only me as the grower and the owner, it's my employees. It's their families, the things they have to deal with. It's the people that come out, you know, from the state of Iowa that work with you. It's the USDA vets that come out. As a farmer and a producer of livestock, you've been taught your whole life to take care of those, that animal. Then when you have to go through that emotion and put that animal down, that's, that's a tough thing for a lot of people. During the latest outbreak, nearly 63 million birds have been affected in more than 360 flocks nationwide. So far, USDA has committed over $750 million for cleanup and compensation. Iowa accounts for nearly 50 of those affected flocks with losses of almost 18 million birds. But for Hawkeye State producers, those numbers are about half of the 2015 outbreak. We had been preparing the answer Mike Nag is the Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Iowa. Uh, you know, in the 2015 outbreak, there was significant movement of the virus. Once it was in a commercial operation, then it, uh, we could connect dots between it spread between. There were people, equipment maybe that was moving and it, it spread laterally or farm to farm. We largely have not seen that in the 22-23 outbreak. Producers can point to tighter biosecurity protocols like boot covers, changing outer clothes when going from barn to barn, or restricting the movement of vehicles from one place to another. Scientists were able to trace the source of the infection to migratory birds. The big concern is, so now it's something that we're kind of living with every day. Officials with USDA say the chance of HPAI-infected poultry entering the food chain is extremely low, and that you cannot get bird flu from birds or eggs that have been properly prepared and cooked. There has been some research into vaccines. Hale is still pushing the basics when it comes to prevention. All right. To me, it's about limiting exposure. You know, it's something obviously you're gonna have to live with, but at the same time, if, if you can lim limit some of the outbreaks, to me, that's the end goal. Uh, this is a constant threat, as is African swine fever, as is foot and mouth disease. Uh, that is how we have to think of high path avian influenza. That's the mindset that our producers have to have. That's the level of readiness that we have to maintain here and at USDA is that it could happen literally now at any time. Used to think it was a spring thing. Now we know that it's something that really can happen any time during the year. For now, Hill and his employees will remain on guard against the virus. There's nobody to blame in these type of situations. It's a disease that's out there. It's carried uh, by these wild geese uh, that migrate. And so, you know, this time of year, both in the spring and now in the fall, when these birds are migrating back and forth, that's when you really start have, have to be on high alert because you just have to be aware that, you know, you have to do everything you can um, to keep that out. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. Next, the Market to Market Report. Three-year lows in corn and wheat were reached this week as export sales picked up on those reduced prices. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 26 cents, while March corn improved 2 cents. South American weather again kept the market moving as the dry pattern somewhat broke. The January contract shed six cents and January meal lost 21.40 per ton. March cotton shrank by $1.57 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, January class three milk futures decreased 15 cents. The livestock market was mixed. February cattle shed $1.85. January feeders subtracted 490. And the February lean hog contract improved 132. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index shed 25 ticks. January crude oil dropped $1.08 per barrel. Comex Gold put on 63.60 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell almost five points to settle at 551.50. Joining us now, regular market analyst, Arlen Suderman. Hi, Arlen. 
Good to be with you again, Paul. Good to see you. Let's start in your backyard, mm -hmm. this wheat thing. A lot of the people that have been on the show in recent t weeks have had to hear me ask almost the same question. How much lower can we go? Did last Friday finally put in that low? And if it did, why? <laughs> well, maybe. We've tried to put in a lot of lows. Uh, <laughs> and each time we end up at new lows. And, and I think it's important to understand if you try to correlate U.S. wheat prices with U.S. supply and demand fundamentals, the correlation is extremely low. We figure a correlation of 0.7 or higher is strong, and we get correlations of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, depending on the time period, you, so it's very low. It correlates better with Black Sea fundamentals or with European fundamentals because Black Sea sets the price. And once they run out, then it goes to Europe, the demand does. And once Europe's run out, then they come to the United States. Uh, and the Black Sea right now has lots of wheat. Ukraine is able to ship. Russia is able to ship. Now, when you ask you, back to your question, it looks like Russia has finally found a plateau price. For now, anyway, it looks like may hold. And so if that's the case, perhaps we find a sideways trading range now for a while until we can try to build a story for support. But if you look at the four-month charts, which we show here, it looks like it's been pretty sideways for that time period, too. So when you mention Black Sea regions, the story always becomes, well, what happened now? Are we, as the market, fatigued on what's happened war-wise in that region? Fatigued is a very good way to put it um, because we've gotten tired of the headlines, so to speak, wary of the headlines. And it used to be that a headline of a, a missile attack, drone attack on port infrastructure would bring a sharp rally. It no longer does. Uh, a ship getting, hitting a, a mine in the water no longer brings a market response. And so the market is assuming that Europe is going to work with Ukraine to keep its agriculture flowing, and that means keeping exports flowing. Russia has been unwilling to directly attack ships, although ships have been hit by running into mines or by an errant missile, but they're not targeting those ships per se. And so now we have military escorts of ships, et cetera. And land routes, we're gonna find ways to move over land as well. The market's not gonna care until or unless we get to that point where Ukraine has both the capability and the willingness to shut down or to curtail exports coming out of Russia. And we're assuming that's well below 50% odds now at this point. At some time, that may happen in the future, and that will be a game changer for both the wheat market and the crude oil market, both. But for now, that's a distant thought in the markets. Corn has moved a little bit closer to wheat. I don't know which one's pulling which right now, but again, almost same question. We've had wild movement, but if we maybe stuck that point in the, the red point at the bottom of this corn chart. Yeah, the, the, the big, huge speculative position, short position, sold positions were in the wheat market. Corn was also building up significant short positions. Um, with wheat kind of stabilizing, that allows corn to stabilize a little bit. There's not a bullish story in corn mm -hmm. until or unless we see a, a short safrina crop or winter corn crop in Brazil. That would be well down the road. And so we're we get short covering rallies periodically, but that's about it from a fundamental standpoint. Safrina, you mentioned. Let's talk South America. Mm -hmm. Where is the biggest influence right now? Is it a corn story here in the United States or a soybean story? It's a soybean story now. I'll be corn later. I mean, every time I talk to our Brazil people about the soybean crop, they'll say, yeah, but it's the corn crop that we're concerned about. The safrina crop, which is where they plant right behind the soybean harvester, plant corn, for th produced through the winter months. And so uh, if that sh crop is short, that would increase our exports of corn in the next marketing year, so a year from now. Uh, so it's a long tail on that story. But on soybeans, the question is how much has excessive wet in the south and excessive dry in the north curtailed production? And I get wary of all the doomsdayers who are out there. Maybe it's my age because I've seen so much happen over the last 40 years. Um, but if you look back at the history of Brazil production uh, and look at national deviation from trend, over the last 30 years, they've only seen a deviation from trend of 10% or more twice. Once was 11% and once was 14%. 
And the year that's been most like this year in weather patterns is the 15-16 growing season for soybeans. And in that year, we saw an 11% below trend for the center west district. We saw 41% below trend for the northeast where it's not as concentrated planting. And the south was like 9% above trend and nationally they were eight to 9% below trend. So let's just say this is a 10% below trend year. That would be 147 million metric tons. Our team came out with a production estimate today from a customer survey. It's what the farmers are telling us nationally of 161.9 million metric tons, down 3.1 from last month. Now that may come down some more, but that's still several million metric tons above a record crop. We can go down all the way to 147 million metric tons without the necessity to increase U.S. exports because of increased production elsewhere and because of demand, and USDA has a demand inflated right now in the balance sheet. Um, and so it's going to take a while to really necessitate rationing demand with higher prices. Well, then let's tie that question to this one that came in uh, from Saskatchewan. Ken in Saskatchewan wants to know, Arlen, we keep hearing we need low prices to spur demand. Are the prices low enough to spur demand yet? Yeah, and I, I spoke to a group of Brazilian farmers last night and they were asking, you know, what's it going to take? Are, are we going to see a decrease in demand continue? And I said, well, d surplus supplies always create new demand. We're very innovative in the industry. We will create new demand, but it does take some t periods of uh, pain. Are we there yet? No. Now, that's not saying we're going to go there, but I don't think we're there at that point of the next big innovation right now on the corn side. But certainly that opportunity is there if we could simply get the White House to agree uh, to the formula that would be favorable for ethanol for sustainable aviation fuel, then you'd have this whole new demand sector there. We're, no, we're not there at this point. Let's get to a demand story of a different ilk, and that is in the livestock market. Mm -hmm. we're, we're moving past Thanksgiving. We're into that Christmas. But live cattle keep having this story of is there demand, is there not demand, is it still tied to everything in the stock market, is it not? That chart tells me not good things. What's it telling you? Well, the funds had built over 100,000 net long positions contracts eight weeks ago, eight, nine weeks ago. They've dropped it down probably below 25,000 now. So they've really liquidated and we've seen the price come down as a result. And that was largely because um, we pulled so many cattle forward because of the weather that we squeezed them all and feedlots are full. That's why one reason we've seen the feeder cattle market collapse. Feedlots in western Kansas are full. There's not room for any more right now. And so we've got this compaction of supply right now. By doing so, we created a bigger hole down the road. Furthermore, we're still liquidating cows. The last weekly data showed 83,000 cows slaughtered. That's the biggest for the year and we're still liquidating this cow herd. Now, maybe we only contract on January one inventory report only shows a 2.5% contraction versus a 4.5, you know, excuse me, million, 2.5 million versus four last year or something like that. But it's still a significant contraction. We haven't started to rebuild. When we rebuild, we'll tighten it up even more. It comes down to demand by the consumer. Export demand has already been rationed. How much is the consumer willing to pay? We're starting to see some of that happen now, move down to value chain. And there's been uh, sales in the hog industry too. I mean, I keep watching some of the pork prices at the, at the grocery store keep dropping. Have they already gone through this situation? Uh, they have to a great extent. Now, in the next few weeks, we're gonna have some of our biggest slaughter of the year totals coming through. We're right in the middle of it. Now we got another two to three weeks to go with these big slaughter numbers and then it eases up. Even with that, we're seeing um, very heavy carcass weights. Same thing as in cattle. We're seeing record steer weights, carcass weights, record heifer carcass weights. So we're putting a lot of meat on the system. Once we get past the first of the year, we should start easing that up. We have some very specific livestock questions that we will get to in Market Plus. But uh, before you go, Arlen, uh, quickly on cotton. Uh, this, again, sounds like a broken record. I think I, I say the same thing. You're going to tell me the same thing about it. Deflationary commodities market right now situation. Same thing in cotton. We've come down. Now we're consolidating sideways. Demand is simply a problem. It's a soft demand economy struggling.
Does anything change that here in the near term? No, not until we get the global economy to really pick up. China's been picking up purchases lately, but not enough to really make a difference. All right, Arlen, I'm just getting started. I have a whole lot of questions. Some of these are very detailed, so we'll get to those in a moment, but uh, just hold for right now. Thank you, sir. Arlen Suderman. And uh, please hang on here, because as I said, we're going to pause this chat, continue our discussion about the markets in our Market Plus segment. You can find both analysis and plus on our website of markettomarket.org. It is card writing season, so how about you spend some time telling us about the first time that you watched our program? Send an old-fashioned email to markettomarket at iowapbs.org, and we'll open up a conversation. Next week, a check of a homegrown industry at the crossroads of commerce and conservation. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.